the thing that moved me the most, it's the only thing that I can think of that made me cry as I was translating it, was the story called God's Own about a Polish woman who's living in New Zealand who returns to see a formerly very close friend in Poland in very dire circumstances. When I was sort of inhabiting the story in order to translate it, it just crushed me. I was so devastated. Um, which it was a great feeling, too. Like, I felt like I was really part of the book as, I, as that happened. That was Jennifer Croft talking about translating Olga Tokarczuk's novel Flights from the original Polish into English. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Flights is a distinctive work, so original it's difficult to classify, and I'm not sure why anybody would want to classify it. Its theme is movement, and it travels centuries and countries. Set between the 17th and 21st century, Flights consists of 116 chapters or fragments or vignettes. Take your pick, whatever you want to call them. Some fictional, some factual. They range from one-page ruminations on airports, hotel lobbies, or Wikipedia, to stories that are as long as 30 pages about, for example, a man's search for his wife and child who disappear while they're all vacationing, or Chopin's sister smuggling her brother's heart into Poland, or a 17th century Dutch anatomist uncovering the body's complexities. It's a masterpiece of imagination and wit. And Jennifer Croft translated it into English seamlessly. In fact, Jennifer brought more than her artistry as a translator to the project. Her persistence is central to the book's publication in English. Flights was first published in Poland in 2008, which is when Jennifer first read it. Croft then spent 10 years translating excerpts from it for small journals while shopping it around to publishers. A grant from the National Endowment for the Arts allowed her to immerse herself in completing the translation, and she finally convinced an independent British publisher, Fitzcarraldo, to move forward with publication. The result? Flights won the 2018 Man Booker International Prize, which goes to the best work of fiction translated from any language into English. Because it's a prize awarded to a translation of a novel, it was shared equally by the author, Olga Tokarczuk, and translator, Jennifer Croft. Jennifer Croft is well known for her translating skills. She's that rare person who works with both Slavic and Romance languages, translating Polish, Ukrainian, and Argentine Spanish into English. Translation itself is such a strange alchemy. The empathy, the artistry, the intellectual acrobatics needed to move literature successfully from one language into another always seems rather mysterious to me. And so, of course, I'm equally mystified by people who choose to pursue it. So when I spoke with Jennifer Croft, I began with the obvious question. So, of course, question number one, what drew you to translation? You know, I think it was a number of different factors. I grew up in Oklahoma, and I grew up always wanting to travel. And I also always wrote travel stories, so just kind of fantasy stories when I was a little kid about butterflies who traveled and birds that migrated and stuff like that. And when I was 13, my sister and I watched the Winter Olympics religiously for whatever reason. It just struck us at that age that we had to do that. And there were some figure skaters that we just fell in love with, and they were Russian. And I started learning Russian that way, just kind of inspired by them. And I checked out some books from the public library. And because I had already been writing and reading a lot, it was kind of a natural transition over the next few years into translation. Did you know any Russians? Didn't know any Russians personally. That is a hard language. <laughs> it is, yeah. I remember I checked out some cassette tapes and some some textbooks. And then at some point, my father found a Ukrainian man to give us like private lessons, which was very helpful. But it was a hard language. But we were homeschooled, and I had a lot of free time, and that's how I spent it. <laughs> so then how do you begin a career as a translator. What are the steps here? Yeah. 
I think you can begin in so many different ways. I think the main thing for me has always been practice. I did an, an MFA in literary translation at the University of Iowa, which was also pretty helpful in the sense that I kind of started to learn about the community of translators. And I moved to Poland as soon as I was finished with that degree, which is also helpful in different ways. I also translated from Spanish, which I learned by moving to Argentina. And although I had at that point already been translating Slavic languages for quite a while, it still took me a couple of years to feel fully comfortable and proficient translating from Spanish. So I've kind of pieced it together as I've gone along. Okay, so what attracted you to Polish? What attracted me to Polish was the fact that it was my only option when I arrived at the University of Iowa, where I went to study Russian. There was a weird coup in the Slavic department about a month before classes began, and suddenly they were no longer offering Russian stuff that I could take. So there was Polish, and it was a Slavic language, and I figured it couldn't be you know, that difficult to move into Polish from Russian. And... I ended up having an amazing professor named Christopher Wirtz who just really suited my learning style perfectly. And and then I started reading, and actually Olga Tokarczuk was one of the first writers I read. I always looked for contemporary women writers. That felt like part of that community that I wanted to build. And I found her and fell in love with her work. So I really stuck with it after that. How would you differentiate? Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian, just in subtleties. What are what are some of the differences? Because Slavic languages are close, but clearly quite different, too. Yeah. Well, I remember when I first started studying Polish, it sounded like drunk Russian to me. There's a lot of like softer sounds. Now it just sounds obviously completely normal, and I've forgotten a lot of Russian. But yeah, the, one of the main differences is that the grammar of Polish has remained almost fully intact, so it's a lot more regular. You know, English, for example, is an extremely irregular language. I honestly can't understand how anyone learns English as a non-native speaker. It must be so challenging at a more advanced level because you just have to learn each individual thing on its own. Whereas Polish, there are a lot of rules and it's kind of harder in the beginning. But then once you've mastered the rules, you can just switch to autopilot and it's really nice in that way. Russian is more irregular. Even the pronunciation, you never know quite which syllable the stress is going to be on, which makes it hard to even just kind of read a page. I'd like to take a step back and and talk about what goes into translating, because obviously this isn't a word-for-word endeavor. We all know what Google Translate can do to any passage. Translation really is an interpretive art. Yeah, absolutely. I always think of it as a combination between the most intimate kind of reading and creative writing. So I always try to get inside the writer's head as much as possible without actually consulting the writer, and that's just a personal preference of mine. But I want the text to stand on its own. So I don't want the author to tell me the backstory of anything. I just want to read it, and I want to convey what I've understood to be the atmosphere and the tone and the characters and the plot. And then I write a new thing. So... I think it's a it's a great moment for translators in the United States right now. We're getting a lot more attention than we have in a while. And I think that's really important because you are reading a mediated book when you pick up a translation, and it's essential that you remember that. Well, for a long time, translators were invisible. Well, right. Until very recently, it was fairly common to just omit the translator's name entirely which is crazy because what if someone does a bad job, for example? What if I do a bad job? What if I decide that I am going to translate a book from German, not actually speaking German, but I just do it anyway? I do a terrible job, and then and you don't see my name anywhere on that project, and you just think it's the author's fault that the author is actually terrible despite having had good reception in their native country. So I think we have to, we translators have to take responsibility for any mistakes we make or just not doing a very good job. And we also can take credit for for what we do correctly. For jobs well done. Yeah, of course. Well, speaking of credit, uh, (laughs) you and Olga Tukarczyk won the International Man Booker for Flights, which is a book that she wrote originally a decade ago. When and how did you first come across flights? 
when I was still at the University of Iowa, I had found her collection of short stories, and I had figured out through a little bit of internet research that there was already someone translating her into English. So I contacted that person, actually, to ask if she was interested in sharing. I didn't want to swoop in and scoop up her author. So we talked about it quite a bit, and I started with those stories. And when Flights came out, Antonia Lloyd-Jones, the other translator of Olga Tokarczuk, was unavailable for various reasons. And, and it was also just a more experimental book than what Olga had done in the past. And I was in the middle of doing a PhD in comparative literary studies and thinking a lot about the structure of the novel. And so it was really exciting to me to read. And I really wanted to do it. And there it was. And so I met with Olga and we talked about it then. And from that point forward, I started sending out excerpts, which is usually the way it works in the English-speaking world, unlike books that are being translated from English into German or Dutch or French or whatever. So in the English-speaking world, most of my translator colleagues will write up a book report that's between 10 and 20 pages that gives like an overall sense of what the book is about, what it's like, who the author is, etc. You did that for Flights. I did it for, yeah, I've done it for every book I've published. Okay, we'll come back to that, but go ahead. <laughs> Flights is a hard book to summarize, of course. So in the case of Flights, I did rely pretty heavily on excerpts. I don't know if there is such a thing as a representative excerpt of Flights, but my goal was to translate lots of different styles and characters and time periods and places and just start publishing them in different American magazines. And I also was meeting with editors at the time. And of course, as you know, I got a National Endowment for the Arts grant, which was life-saving support. I don't think I would have been able to, con I know I wouldn't have continued with the project had it not been for that. Can we just backtrack one second? And can you just give just a bit of a sense of why Flights is unusual and the structure of it for people who might not have read it yet. Absolutely. So Olga calls it a constellation novel, which the idea of that is that she has given lots of different anecdotes and stories and ideas, and she leaves it to the reader to connect the dots in the same way that ancient people looked up at the sky, saw stars, and imagined the shapes that might arise in between those stars. Oh, it's the Great Dipper. Exactly. Yeah. So I think one of the great things about this book, Olga is often very moving, but also very playful and inviting at the same time. So it's fun to do that, for me anyway, to link these people together however I want to do it without being forced by the author. So it's a different kind of plot. I mean, it can be argued that there is no overall plot in this book, but you can decide that on your own. That's up to you. Well, that brings me to something. So many authors are purposefully ambiguous in their writing. Translating ambiguity, it would strike me as so difficult. For me, it would be immensely challenging. Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head. That's something I've been thinking about so much, and I want to write about that. I don't have an answer for how we do that. I think it's probably the most common mistake that experienced translators make. And I catch myself over explaining all the time. I mean, translation and explanation are so closely related. The word in Polish is actually the same, tłumaczyć. My job with a translation is to make sure that the reader in the target language has all of the information he or she needs to get the message of the book. And sometimes that means supplying cultural context, so adding information that isn't in the original because the original readers already have all of the information they need. They have the historical context or the geographical context or whatever. But this is part of why I also don't like to consult the author with questions that I may have because if I add in additional information that the original reader doesn't have, it just turns it into a completely different project. You can do that if you're translating your own work. You know, like Nabokov got very involved in his translations from Russian into English or from Russian into French or from English into French and was essentially rewriting his novels. But that isn't the project that I'm doing when I'm working with somebody like Olga. So 
I try really hard. Right now I'm translating her newest novel, which is extremely difficult. And Phil, she did 10 years of research in order to write it. And I am doing research, but I'm also trying to really make sure with every sentence that I'm not adding my own research to the book. Well, when do you research? Did you research as you were translating flights, for example, because not only is it a constellation, but it's a constellation that really moves through time. And, you know, there's this piece in the, what is it, the 1650s, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to do with uh, an anatomist. Mm -hmm. That was the hardest section, for sure. I've always been a contemporary literature person, and an, that is the most difficult thing for me with her work, is to do the historical sections. I didn't do as much research for flights. The new novel, which is called The Books of Jacob, is the entirely... The 900-page tome. Ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The 900-page tome is set in the 18th century, and it's set all over the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So it's just all research. Yeah, but a lot of it is about, it's about a cult leader, essentially. It's about a man named Jacob Frank who led a Jewish heretical sect that converted to Christianity and then Islam. And it is really all about the mystery of faith and, and despair, of course, but also the, this mysterious appeal that any cult leader has. And by choosing the wrong adjective, you could give away too much about Jacob Frank. So it's very subtle work to maintain the mystery. So what would you research or what did you research, for example, on flight, since that's already been out, if you don't want to talk about what hasn't been published yet? That section that you mentioned was really the only one where I had to look up any kind of terms. Terminology is not so present in flights. So with flights, I just translated in the way that I always translate, which is to double check the meanings of some words and kind of see in what context they tend to appear. That's always helpful in gauging the strength of a certain word, like how how emphatic is a given adjective and just like look it up in articles or or whatever. Um, if I did have questions, I would ask other native speakers. It's rare at this point with the internet to have things that you really can't solve. I mean, and especially with a writer like Olga, who doesn't particularly use neologisms or difficult. She doesn't use difficult language. She uses very beautiful language, but, but it's not inaccessible in any way. And getting the narrative voice of any book. I mean, I know as a reader, it, it can take me some time to do that, depending on the writer. How long does it take you as a translator to feel like, okay, I have this narrative voice? I think for me, it's dependent a lot on from project to project. I have been fortunate in that I have mostly translated books that I just have read and fallen in love with. So there's already some connection there. I feel very connected to Olga, also since I've been working with her for such a long time. So it doesn't take as long when I start a new thing. Olga is incredibly prolific, so I'm always starting a new thing of Olga's. And she's also very, not experimental exactly overall, I wouldn't say, but very exploratory. She is very willing, very open. So her latest publication is a collection of science fiction stories, and I didn't have any trouble getting into any of those. Kind of from the first word, I, I felt things click. Flights. That had to have been a challenging book in some ways. I mean, it's so it's so distinctive. Yeah. I mean, the structure of it. Yeah. In a way, that made it less challenging for me because, I mean, also my life was kind of somehow mirroring the structure of the book. I was living in Buenos Aires, Argentina, for the most part, but also traveling always. And it was a really convenient book to do as I went from place to place because I could just translate one self-contained 20-page story over a period of, you know, a couple weeks in Berlin, which is actually where I started the book. And then I could take a break, do something else. I mean, obviously, I, because it took 10 years to find a publisher, I was obviously doing other projects in the interim. So it was a nice thing to be able to dip in and out of. And I, and I think that applies to the reading of it as well. You can sit down and just read it for a few days, or you can read it occasionally over the course of a year. And I think both of those scenarios are, are really good ones. 
Can you compare translating expository text versus dialogue? Is there a difference? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good question that no one has ever asked me before. I actually really love translating dialogue. I not too long ago translated my first play, and I just thought it was so much fun. Obviously, the register is different usually when you're translating dialogue versus just the narrative, the narrator's Usually Olga has an omniscient narrator who has a more neutral style, whatever neutral means. (laughs) But yeah, translating dialogue is really fun right now. I'm doing this, The Books of Jacob, which has so many characters and they're all from such different class backgrounds and religious backgrounds. And Jacob Frank, the main character, doesn't talk that much, but he was famously almost unintelligible in any language. Although people who never heard him in person, he certainly developed a reputation for being extremely eloquent. But when you get up close to him in the book, it's really hard to understand what he's talking about. And so I'm currently trying to figure out how to render. This is another question similar to rendering ambiguity or maintaining ambiguity. How do you render things that are bad without it sounding like just like a bad translation? So if someone sounds silly it's a very fine line. You want them to sound equally silly in English without making it look like a mistake. My partner is also a translator named Boris Streljuk, and he just translated a really wonderful book called Sentimental Tales by a Russian writer named Mikhail Zoshenka. And the whole game of that short story collection is that the narrator is a little bit of an idiot. He's dabbling in literature, doesn't really know what he's talking about, gets goes on these tangents. And so Boris was always, I mean, I think he did an amazing job in the end, but he was always struggling to figure out how exactly to pinpoint that particular brand of nonsense without it sounding like it was just poor English. You know, I'm thinking about Jack Cade in the Henry plays Shakespeare, and he was a populist who just is talking complete and utter gibberish. And I was just thinking, oh, poor translator who had to, you know, who would turn that into another language. Exactly. I want to hear about winning the International Man Booker. Tell me everything. (laughs) I can tell you that the best part about it was that they gave us a full bottle of champagne to split between the two of us as soon as they announced that we had won. (laughs) So where were you when you found out? Well, we so they do it kind of like the Oscars. They have you dress up in your fanciest gown, and they bring you to a dinner where I was just praying that I didn't spill red wine all over my body, which I was sure was going to happen. Um, and I was wearing heels, and I was praying I didn't trip over. <laughs> you have to go up onto the stage whether you win or not. So there, there were six finalists, and they were really, really good. I read all of the other five. I was sure that the French writer Virginie Despont, translated by Frank Wynne, was going to win. In fact, I had actually written a piece. I had interviewed her. She had already been translated by four people into English, and I had interviewed all of them. I had pitched it to LitHub, and the headline was going to be something about this year's Man Booker International winner and her translators. It was already all lined up. I was 100% sure. And there were other really good books in the running, too. But... Instead, we had our dinner, and they announced that we had won, and they whisked us backstage for some champagne and immediately some interviews. And then we did like a full week of just nonstop interviews. And Olga was such a trooper. Doing that in your non-native language is so exhausting, and she was just amazing. And it was we had spent some time together before that, but we really solidified the team and It prepared us really well for the book tour that we did here in the U.S. in the fall. A bonding experience. It was, yeah. Now, you and Olga are friends, correct? Yes. So you don't consult her while you're translating, but I assume she sees it when you're done. She can see it whenever she wants. In general, what I do is send people the draft when I'm done with it, just the first draft, so that they can get involved if they want to. Everybody speaks some English, right? So some people really want to get involved and want to suggest alternatives and maybe even rewrite some things a la Nabokov. And Olga, as I mentioned, she's so prolific and she's so daring in the sense that she's always wanting to explore new territory. Once she's finished with the book, she's on to the next thing. I think she really trusts her translators. We all kind of know each other and have met a few times in Poland and 
it's important to her to have good relationships with us, but she she's always writing a new book and she doesn't want to get bogged down in, in what she's already done. You translate Polish, Ukrainian, and Argentinian Spanish, Argentine Spanish. First, why Argentine Spanish? Only because as of right now, I have only lived in Argentina. So I spent seven years there. I'm going to be going back next year for a while. And it's very possible that at some point I would add another variant of Spanish. I just feel like in order for me to feel fully comfortable with the tone, conveying a tone, I think it's really important to have had the, the experience of daily life, like to know what, it, what the person at the cash register says at the grocery store and what kind of small talk people make in return, and those rhythms. And I don't have that for any other Spanish-speaking country yet. Is there a difference between translating Slavic languages and a Romance language? Stylistically, culturally, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, although they're Argentina and Poland are both Catholic countries, obviously, I feel like they're really poles apart, no pun intended. It's nice to have that balance. And again, of course, like it depends on the individual writer, and I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations. But but the hit, their literary histories are completely different. Argentina is a new country. Poland is a country with such an important tradition, cultural tradition, and 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 specifically in the case of Poland, a literary tradition. Since Poland was wiped off the map for 150 years their cultural identity kind of rested on their language and their literature. It's definitely a different attitude to literature. That is one generalization that I'm willing to make, even though, I mean, I the reason that I ended up living in Argentina is because people take literature also very seriously, and the cultural life in Buenos Aires is amazing and absolutely wonderful and worth checking out if anyone listening has been curious about Argentina. But translating them... For me, the difference is mainly in the grammar. So Slavic languages, for example, have grammatical case, which means that the endings of nouns change in the same way that verbs change in English. So if I were to say Jenny eats a sandwich or a sandwich eats Jenny, in Polish you would still know that the thing being consumed was the sandwich just because of the ending on the word, which means that the word order is much freer, so you're often having to kind of rearrange things more actively in a Slavic language like Polish than you are in a Romance language like Spanish, which can also be misleading because I find that sometimes when I'm translating Spanish, I leave things more or less as they are, and then I go back and I read it again, and I think, oh, this this doesn't sound natural in English at all. I actually do need to kind of rework the whole sentence, but... That's kind of a main difference. What do you think is the most important trait for a translator? Knowledge of language to one side. (laughs) I think people who are still studying languages have done really wonderful translations. I learned, I mean, as I say, I didn't grow up with any other language. So I don't know exactly what. I think there's a certain kind of receptivity that you have to have. There are all these different metaphors. There's the musical performance metaphor and the acting metaphor. I, having lived in Argentina, think a little bit in terms of a tango metaphor. So if if you've ever danced tango as the follower, which is often the lady's position, you know that following is actually a lot more active than it sounds. You have to really actively kind of lean in to your partner and be so in tune with your partner that you can almost predict their next move and therefore respond instantaneously to it. And that's definitely a skill that can be cultivated. I took tango lessons and that's what those are for. But there there may also be some innate thing about just being able to be empathetic and open and your ego is there. And that's part of this thing about recognizing the translator's work that I mentioned. There's no way for a human being to completely dispose of ego, nor should she, but, but maybe just to also like allow for the presence of, of the author. I think that's, it's almost like, um, this mystical relationship between author and translator that you have to be open to maybe. Not to get too personal, but Supporting yourself as a translator would seem to me to be a sort of hard row to hoe. 
How do you? <laughs> well put. <laughs> how do you manage to do that? Yeah, I think that is such an important thing to consider, especially for people who are thinking about becoming translators. I don't really think that it's possible to live in the United States and be a full-time literary translator. I'm sure there is an exception to that. I think that we are really lucky in the U.S. because we do have programs like the National Endowment for the Arts. As I say, I would not have been able to translate flights or write my first book, which is coming out in the fall, called Homesick, without that support. But I was also living in Argentina, so there, I was playing with exchange rates and making the dollar go a lot farther there than it would have here. This year I have a, a fellowship, a Coleman fellowship at the New York Public Library, which is allowing me to translate the books of Jacob because a lot of times I'm working with independent presses. Like the books of Jacob being a 900-page tome, that's a lot of work, and if I were to do as I did with flights, other work as I was going along in order to pay the bills, it would never be finished. But the publisher isn't in a position to give me a huge advance either. So what they do is pay me when I'm finished based on how much the Book Institute in Poland gives is willing to reimburse them. So I think without the grants and fellowships, it would be probably impossible to sustain myself. I've done a lot of other work that is kind of adjacent to literary translation, most of which has been academic translation. So translating people's literary criticism or art criticism or articles about history. And those are really interesting and I really enjoy it. It ends up being quite a bit of work for, for what it pays, but there's a lot of that to be done, especially if you're working with a language like Polish that doesn't quite have as many translators available. Okay, let's talk about what's coming up next. You mentioned the books of Jacob. Do you think that will be ready in 2019? No. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's supposed to come out in the UK with Fitzcarraldo editions in the fall of 2020 of next year, and then with Riverhead in the spring of 2021. That's the current plan. And what else are you translating right now? I'm just about to finish a wonderful collection of short stories by an Argentine writer named Federico Falco, which is called A Perfect Cemetery, which I, I just love those stories. They're so beautiful. He's just a, an amazing writer. He reminds me a lot of Chekhov. Um, if you've ever read Chekhov's short stories, it's just such moving portraits of people and of communities. Tell me about the memoir that's coming out, and when is that coming out? The memoir, Homesick, is coming out in September. I believe it's September 10th with Unnamed Press. I wrote it as a novel when I was living in Argentina. I wrote it in Spanish, and then I tried to reimagine it for an English-speaking audience, having specifically conceived of it for an Argentine audience. And I ended up adding lots of photographs, which are intended to make the contents of the prose a little bit more ambiguous, constantly going back to this ambiguity idea. Because <laughs> the prose is very simple. It's really about my childhood and my relationship with my sister, who develops very early on uh, some serious illnesses and with whom I was very close. You said that this started as a novel that you wrote in Spanish. Do you think about crossing over and <laughs> taking on the mantle of novelist? Yeah, absolutely. That's my, my next project is a novel. It is about a translator, but it is a novel called Fidelity set in Argentina. And, and in fact, the book Homesick is coming out as a novel in Argentina next year called Serpientes y Escaleras, which means snakes and ladders, like the children's game, shoots and ladders is mostly called here. I don't know. I guess calling it a memoir partly had to do with those photographs. That makes it hard to think of as a novel just because it's so obvious that I'm directly involved in what's happening. The line is fine, though, the autofiction and memoir and semi-autobiographical novel, which is what I used to call it when I was studying literature. So my editor suggested memoir as the genre, and it's not something that I would have thought of or my agent would have thought of, but I kind of like not being too attached to a genre. I like doing the project and focusing on the overall quality of the project and then let people call it whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, that's up to the publishers. You, you, yeah. Yeah. you name it, I'll just write it. Exactly. 
Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joe. It was really such a pleasure to speak with you. The book is amazing. Both of you, you and Olga, it's a great match. And oh, thank you. Congratulations on the International Man Booker. Thank you so much. You're really welcome. appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Jennifer Croft. She's translated, among other works, Olga Tukarchuk's novel, Flights. Both Jennifer and Olga received the 2018 Man Booker International Prize. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. You can subscribe to Artworks wherever you get your podcasts. So please do, and leave us a rating on Apple because it helps people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.